You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. Part 1 Introduction Beneath the small town of Centralia, Pennsylvania in the United States, a relentless coal seam fire has been ravaging the network of old unused mines since May 27, 1962, or possibly earlier, as its exact origins and ignition date are still under discussion. This subterranean blaze extends across some eight miles, reaching up to 300 feet underground over an area of around 3,700 acres. Experts predict that, considering how slowly the fire is consuming the coal, it has the potential to persist for more than two centuries. As a result of the fire's dangers and the subsequent environmental concerns, Centralia was largely vacated in the 1980s its population dwindling dramatically from 1,500 when the fire is believed to have ignited, down to only five residents by 2017, with the majority of the town's structures having been taken down. Part 2 Background On May 7, 1962, the Centralia Council convened to make plans for the cleanup of their municipal landfill in anticipation of Memorial Day. This landfill had been established earlier in the year within a large pit, approximately 300 feet in width and 75 feet in length, which was originally a strip mine 50 feet deep that Edward Whitney excavated back in 1935, situated dangerously close to the Odd Fellows Cemetery. Centralia had an issue with illegal dumping across eight unsanctioned sites and hoped that by creating this official landfill, they could curtail the issue. This was in response to newer state mandates that had required the town to close a previous dumping site near St. Ignatius Cemetery. Although the cemetery trustees were not thrilled with the landfill being so close, they acknowledged the gravity of the illegal dumping issue and believed the new site could be a solution. The state of Pennsylvania had enacted a law in 1956 aimed at preventing the use of strip mines as landfills from sparking destructive mine fires. This legislation stipulated that any town using a strip mine as a landfill must obtain a permit and submit to regular inspections. George Segaritis, who was charged with overseeing landfills in the region for the Department of Mines and Mineral Industries, raised concerns about the structural integrity of Centralia's landfill when he noted holes in its walls and floor. Such structural weaknesses were significant because old strip mines often intersected with older mines beneath them, posing a risk of fire. Segaritis warned Joseph Tai, a member of the Centralia Council, that the pit needed to be filled with non-flammable materials to prevent such a risk. Part 3 Fire In this environment, conditions were far too extreme for any human survival, with heat surpassing that of mercury and an atmosphere filled with toxicity on par with Saturn's. Within the core of this blazing zone, the temperature soared well above 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is equivalent to over 540 degrees Celsius. Deadly mixtures of carbon monoxide and additional hazardous gases drifted among the stone cavities. Part 4 Plan and Execution The local government of Centralia organized an effort to clean up a strip mine dump, but the records don't detail their planned method. It's thought that they avoided mentioning the cleanup by fire due to a state ban on burning dumps. Nonetheless, they went ahead and hired local firefighters to do the job. They set the trash on fire on May 27, 1962, and tried to put it out that evening. The fire rekindled on May 29, and despite efforts to extinguish it once more, it persisted. On June 4, the fire reemerged, leading to further attempts to put it out including the use of a bulldozer to expose the deeper layers of trash to be doused. Later, a 15-foot hole was discovered, which had been hidden by garbage and wasn't filled to prevent fires. This oversight likely contributed to the spread of the fire to the extensive mine tunnels beneath the town. Despite repeated efforts and obvious signs that the dump was still burning, including complaints of bad smells at a local church, the town continued to allow waste disposal at the site. A union president visited at the invitation of a council member and advised them to take further action. An engineer offered to remove the burning material for a fee, and a mine inspector conducted tests, which revealed 
dangerous levels of carbon monoxide, indicating a mine fire was indeed present. Part 5 Escalation The local government in Centralia notified the Lehigh Valley Coal Company through a formal letter about a fire, but they chose not to disclose its actual cause, possibly believing that doing so would result in the coal company not offering any assistance. Instead, they vaguely attributed the fire to an unknown cause during a spell of extreme heat. Before a meeting scheduled for August 6th that would bring together officials from both the Lehigh Valley Coal Company and the Susquehanna Coal Company at the fire's location, James Schober Sr., Deputy Secretary of Mines, anticipated that the company representatives would declare they couldn't fund the extinguishing efforts. Consequently, Schober foresaw that it would fall upon the state to cover the $30,000 cost of removing the fire, an amount that would be around $290,000 in today's dollars. During this meeting, an alternative solution was presented by Alonzo Sanchez, a local strip mine operator. His proposition was to put out the fire for free with the condition that he could keep any coal he unearthed without paying for it to the Lehigh Valley Coal Company. Part of his plan included conducting exploratory drilling to determine the extent of the fire, which likely contributed to his offer being turned down due to anticipated delays and potential legal issues surrounding mining rights. Around the same time, state mine inspectors were regularly visiting mines in the Centralia area to monitor for deadly carbon monoxide levels. On August 9th, they discovered such dangerous levels, prompting the closure of all mines in the area the following day. Part 6, First Excavation Project At a United Mine Works of America meeting on August 12th in Centralia, Secretary of Mines Lewis Evans was prompted to take action on a mine fire issue. By August 15th, he communicated in writing that he had greenlit a project to address the situation and that proposals for the work would be looked at on August 17th. Shortly thereafter, a company from near Mount Carmel called Britty Inc., was selected for the job, with a budget close to $20,000, which would be equivalent to about $193,000 in the year 2022. The initiative kicked off on August 22nd. The Department Overseeing Mine Activities, DMMI, estimated the excavation would involve around 24,000 cubic yards, but restricted Britty from doing any investigative drilling to ascertain the fire's reach or depth. Instead, the company had to adhere strictly to the plans laid out by engineers who assumed the fire wasn't particularly extensive or vigorous, estimating its size and location simply by observing the steam emerging from the landfill rock. Starting at the northern edge of the landfill, Britty began to dig outwards approximately 200 feet. Nonetheless, the approach was flawed from the start. When mining chambers were deliberately breached, it allowed a surge of oxygen which exacerbated the fire. According to Steve Kissela, who operated a bulldozer for the project, the increased oxygen allowed the fire to advance beyond their point of excavation by the time they drilled and blasted each section. Britty's machinery, a shovel only able to move 2.5 cubic yards per scoop, was also too small for such a demanding task. Moreover, the state only allowed the Britty team to work eight-hour shifts during daylight hours on weekdays meaning progress was slow. There was even a halt in operations for five days over Labor Day weekend in September. To compound the difficulties, the fire was moving northward and going deeper into the coal seam, leading to further challenges and escalating costs. Despite their efforts, Britty managed to dig up 58,580 cubic yards before funding ran out, and they were forced to cease operations on October 29, 1962, leaving the project incomplete and the fire still raging. Part 7, Second Excavation Project Shortly before the Britty project concluded on October 29th, a new strategy was suggested to combat the mine fire in Centralia. The idea was to fill the mines with a mixture of crushed stone and water to stop the fire from spreading. It was projected that this would cost around $40,000, which is comparable to $387,000 today. When bids were called for on November 1st, K&H Excavating won with an offer of $28,400, or about $275,000 in today's money. 
To implement this, drilling was executed, creating holes 20 feet apart around the perimeter of the landfill in a half-circle pattern. Despite these efforts, the project faced several challenges. During its execution, Centralia was hit by an intense snowstorm and uncharacteristically cold weather, resulting in freezing water pipes and rock grinder. These incidents hampered the timely blending and application of the water and crushed rock mixture. Additionally, there was concern from the Department of Mines and Mineral Industries, DMMI, that the 10,000 cubic yards of material meant for the project might not be sufficient to completely fill the mines, which could allow the fire a path to continue spreading. Due to these complications, the allocated funding was quickly spent. To keep the project going, an extra $14,000, the equivalent of about $135,000 today, was sanctioned by Secretary Evans. However, by March 15, 1963, the funds were completely exhausted and the total expense reached $42,420, roughly equivalent to $410,000 today. The ineffectiveness of the strategy became apparent on April 11th when steam emerged from new ground openings, revealing that the fire had moved eastward by about 700 feet, demonstrating the failure of the flushing project to halt the fire's progression. Part 8, Third Project Shortly thereafter, a proposal with three potential solutions was created, although initiation of the project was postponed until after the fiscal year commencing on July 1, 1963. The first proposal, with an estimated cost of $277,490, involved creating a trench to contain the fire and then filling it with non-flammable materials. The second proposal, at a cost of $151,740, proposed a smaller, semicircular trench that would eventually be connected and sealed with a barrier at ground level. The third and least expensive option, priced at $82,300, aimed for an extensive and unified flushing effort, more extensive than the second proposal's flushing component. However, in 1963, the state decided to forego this entire project. Part 9, Later Remediation Projects David DeCock commenced his coverage of the mine fire for the local newspaper, The News Item in Shimokan, in the latter part of 1976. Over a decade, up to 1986, he penned in excess of 500 articles on the subject. In 1979, community awareness of the serious nature of the fire grew significantly after an event involving the gas station owner and mayor at the time, John Coddington. While checking his fuel tanks with a dipstick, he noticed it was unusually warm. To confirm his suspicions, Coddington used a thermometer on a string and found the gasoline inside had reached a startling temperature of 172 degrees Fahrenheit, 77.8 degrees Celsius. Starting in 1980, individuals in the area began reporting health issues thought to be connected to toxic emissions from the fire, such as carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, along with reduced oxygen levels. The situation garnered broader attention from across the state, reaching a critical point in 1981. That year, a sinkhole measuring four feet wide and 150 feet deep unexpectedly gave way beneath 12-year-old Todd Domboski in his own backyard. The boy narrowly escaped death by gripping onto a tree root until his cousin, Eric Wolfgang, who was 14 years old, heroically rescued him by hauling him out of the rapidly forming pit. A lethal concentration of carbon monoxide was detected in the steam venting from this hole, indicating the dangers lurking beneath the town's surface. Part 10, Possible Origins. Various theories exist concerning the origins of the Centralia mine fire. Some suggest the blaze began prior to May 27, 1962. David DeCock believes the town's intentional trash burning on that date ignited a coal seam through a breach in the dump site, spreading the fire to the abandoned mines beneath Centralia. Joan Quigley, in her book from 2007, contends that the fire started a day earlier due to a garbage hauler dumping still hot ash or coal remnants into the pit. She points to records from a June 1962 borough council meeting and statements from firefighters to support her claim that the borough's failure to separate the trash layers with fireproof clay allowed the fire to reach the coal below, setting off a larger underground fire. 
Others speculate that the fire dated back even further, ignited by a 1932 Bast Colliery mine fire that supposedly never ceased. This legend suggests the fire extended to the dump site in 1962. However, Frank Jurgel Sr. challenges this theory, arguing that he would have encountered the lethal gases from the long-standing fire when he illicitly mined near the site between 1960 and 1962. Councilman Joseph Tai offered a different view, hypothesizing that Centralia's fire was actually triggered by a nearby separate coal seam fire that had been burning and was accidentally linked to the landfill on May 27th, leading to the larger disaster. Finally, a letter from the Centralia Council to the Lehigh Valley Coal Company shortly after the fire's discovery mentioned a fire that arose around June 25, 1962, during a heat wave, hinting at spontaneous combustion as the cause. This idea of a naturally occurring fire starting point was widely accepted by state and federal authorities for some time. Part 11, Aftermath. In 1984, a congressman from Wilkes-Barre named Frank Harrison introduced a bill that was passed by Congress, allotting over $42 million, equivalent to about $118 million today, to help move people away from Centralia. Most of the town's inhabitants decided to take the government's offer and leave, but a few chose to remain, despite pressure from state authorities. By 1992, Governor Bob Casey of Pennsylvania decided to utilize the power of eminent domain to force the evacuation of the entire town, leading to the condemnation of its buildings. Attempts by the residents to overturn this action were unsuccessful. Ten years later, the U.S. Postal Service discontinued the zip code for Centralia, removing another piece of the town's identity. In 2009, Governor Ed Rendell initiated the official eviction of those still living in Centralia. By the start of 2010, only five households were holding out, with some residents claiming they were being defrauded because of the valuable anthracite coal deposits beneath the town. Ultimately, in 2012, these residents' appeal against the eminent domain proceedings failed, and once more they were told to vacate. However, in late 2013, an agreement was made with the seven remaining inhabitants that they could stay for the rest of their lives after which their properties would be claimed by the state through eminent domain. The underground mine fire that led to Centralia's evacuation also caused the abandonment of the nearby town of Burnsville. With its inhabitants gone, the town was leveled. Despite its troubled history, Centralia has become a place of interest for tourists, who visit to see the smoke rising from the deserted streets and the closed segment of PA Route 61, nicknamed Graffiti Highway, this road became off-limits in April 2020 when it was covered with dirt by the private landowner, blocking people from accessing it. Fascinatingly, the thermal-induced pressure from the mine fires combined with heavy rainfall has resulted in the creation of a geyser in Pennsylvania called the Big Mine Run Geyser. Located on private land near Ashland, it was kept open for flood control. The Centralia Mine Fire and its aftermath have caught the attention of various media, being featured in America Declassified on the Travel Channel, Radio Lab's podcast episode about cities, and on 99% Invisible's podcast. Moreover, the film Silent Hill, while set in West Virginia, took inspiration from the events that unfolded in Centralia.